our dear viewers and listeners. We greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study. Once again, we request you to invite somebody to join you for today's session. And we believe your life will be spent profitably for the kingdom. But before we begin today's session, let's open up with prayer. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you yes, Lord. for your love, mm. your grace, mm. and for the Holy Spirit that was given to us. Yes, Lord. Lord, we pray, mm. let your word come alive. Yes, Lord. Reveal Jesus today. Mm. Let him come in his power and glory and majesty. Yes, Lord. To touch lives, mm. to change, yes, Lord. to save, mm. to lift, yes. to encourage, yes, Lord. to exalt. Mm. Let no name be exalted today. Mm above any other name, but only the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we'll take today's text from the book of Romans chapter 6 from verse 1 to verse 7. Let's read. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer? Or oh, do you not know? That as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him through the baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, Certainly we shall be like in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin may be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who died, or for he who has died, has been freed from sin. Father, bless your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We began on this subject of sanctification. And just to recap, we say that sanctification comes from a Greek word hagiasmos. And it is from that very word that we get words like hagios, which means holy, and hagion, which means saint. Now, which means hagiasmos, which is the word sanctification. When you look at it in the context of these three words, Hagiasmos, Hagion, and Hagios. When you put them in context, they refer to one thing. Separate. 
So what that means is to be separate. So what that means is to get an object and split it and separate it. So when we are talking about separation in the spiritual matters, it means several things. When we mean separation, we are talking about holy. In others, when we say to be holy, we are meaning to be separated. In others, it also means to be set apart. But this being set apart has two components. Separated from and separated to or set apart from and set apart to. And when we look at this in the respect of sin, we understand several things that come to mind. We looked at the negative aspect of it. In other words, what were you separated from? So to be holy or to be sanctified means to be separated from certain things. Number one, it is to be set apart from sin, from the rule and governance of sin over your life, or from the dominion of sin over your life. And that happens to every believer when they come to the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing, it is to be set apart from the world. And the word we are talking about, the evil world system. We understand that the evil is in charge of so many things. When we come to Jesus Christ, we discover that we lose appetite for certain things. And that loss of appetite causes you to be separate from many of the systems that the world has put in place. The third is the separation from the devil himself. Before we come to Jesus Christ, we are captives of evil. We are captives of sin. We are captives of the devil. So everything he desires to do, he does it at will. When we come to Jesus Christ, he separates us from the devil himself. So sanctification produces that radical break from the powers of the world, from the powers of the flesh, and from the devil himself. But this is not all it is about. You are separated too. So the essence is that you are not separated just to be let out, out to do your own. Stuff. No, 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 no. You are separated unto something that is glorious, something that is good, something that is eternally beneficial, something that is worthwhile. So you are separated unto the image of God, unto the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you are also separated 
unto the purposes of the kingdom of God. So when we refer to sanctification, we noted that sanctification deals with what God is doing in us. To make us more like his son, Jesus Christ. And in this text, there are certain things that we need to be observant about as we respond to this whole sanctification idea. And the four observations that I want us to make note of is one, when does it happen? So sanctification happens to the believer when they come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it happens when you believe. So when, if you are watching or listening to us and you have believed the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been sanctified. So it, it is not that God will do it and then wait for you to do something, then he does the next thing takes the next step. No, it happens that same moment. And you need that split second that Jesus came into your life at that moment that is when your spirit was converted and that produced a radical transformation in your life and this happens to every believer and this hinges on one very important aspect. Your union with Jesus Christ. I love the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 7. It says who, whoever is joined to the Lord is one spirit. What that means is that when you come to Jesus Christ, you become one, one spirit. And that is fundamental. That is life changing. Because this is not a physical union. This is a spiritual union. And its impact to any believer is very impactful. You see, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, according to Jesus' teaching, in John chapter 14 and verse 20, you are in Christ. And Christ is in you. The impact of that, or the implication of this is that whatever holds true to the Lord Jesus Christ, it holds true for you. So if Jesus references to God as Father, then you call God Father. And God refers to you as son or daughter. So it doesn't matter where you're coming from. Your union with Christ places you in a position where from a spiritual perspective you cease to be who you were before. And whatever Christ has accomplished, you become it becomes a reality in your life. Why? Because you have been joined 
to the Lord. And the scripture says that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So that is what has happened to you. That is the basis of what has happened to you. And in today's passage, Paul breaks it down to what exactly happened. How did this union with Jesus Christ impact your life? What happens to every true born again believer? What happens to their lives? And he begins in verse 2 by asking a question that how shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Now, this is a statement of fact. And this is an accomplished reality. By this question, Paul is making an assertion which I don't want any of us to miss. And this is the point he's trying to make. That every believer in Jesus Christ has died to sin. He's not dying. He has died to sin. And that is the reason they are no longer living in it. So our union with Christ means that we died to sin. So what does dying to sin mean? It means that you died to the reign of sin in your life. So sin now no longer has dominion over you. Why? Because sin reigned in death. According to Romans chapter 5 verse 21. So believers have now died to the dominant rule of sin in their lives. And this is very fundamental. Because now, death and sin are no longer holding you captive. The dominion of sin has been broken over your life as a believer in Jesus Christ. The control of sin over a believer's life is broken the day they come to Jesus Christ. That union separates you instantly it severs and separates you from the dominion of sin. From the reign of sin over your life. And you are now joined to the Lord. Before your conversion, the only thing we do is to pursue sin. Everything that you do is to fulfill the desires of sin. But when you are brought into union with Jesus Christ, it now becomes impossible for the domineering power of sin to reign in your life as a believer. So previously, and that's why Paul makes this, I says, how can we live in sin? Basically, he's trying to say you cannot. So what does it mean to live in sin? So to live in sin means several things. It means 
to live for it. Basically, it also means to be consumed by sin. Thirdly, it means to be under the grip of the power of sin. And fourthly, it means to live sin as a habitual lifestyle. So when you come to Jesus Christ, you are joined with him. And it is that union that breaks that hold of sin over your life. The second point Paul puts across is found in verse 3 where he asks another question and says, oh, do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death. He is making a statement of fact. And what is the statement of fact? He asks the question, do you not know? Basically, he's trying to say this is common knowledge. This is what happened. Are you not aware of this fact? So at a certain point in time, what Paul wants to state is that now you have been baptized or you have been placed in Christ Jesus. So now you have been immersed in Christ Jesus. You have been submerged in Christ Jesus. And it is not about being dry and then being wet. I have stated before that when we regard, when we talk about baptism, we draw this term from the merchants or we draw this term from the people who deal in the dying of clothes. So when you immerse a piece of cloth into a dye, this piece of cloth picks on the color of the dye. If the dye was red, from that moment onwards, this piece of cloth will always be referred to as a red cloth because it was immersed in a solution that is color red. So it now picks on a new identity and bears that identity going forward. That is the whole point about being baptized. When we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we now pick on his identity. We pick on a new nature. And it is that nature that we walk with going forward. So he's reminding us that we are baptized into Christ Jesus. Therefore, we have picked on a new identity. So it is no longer the old identity that we have. Like that red piece of cloth I talked about, you now have the identity of Christ. You have put on Christ. And this is not referring to a water baptism. This is the baptism of the Spirit. You are joined with the Lord. You become one in spirit. And this is what the apostle time and again calls us to have a 
a look at. And several scriptures he points out. Colossians 2 12. First Corinthians 12 13. Ephesians 4 5. He is trying to emphasize this that we have now become one with Christ. So everything that holds true for Jesus Christ holds true for every one of us. So when Christ died for sin, then we died to sin. So we were baptized. In other words, you are now placed into union with him. And I want you to see what the term he uses, baptized into Christ Jesus. So the day you sell yes to Jesus Christ. The day he becomes your savior and lord. You are regenerated. Putting it in the perspective that we talked about in the previous chapter. God takes you from the lineage of Adam and now places you into Christ Jesus. And this is a spiritual fact. So you have been baptized into his death. And this is important. What he means that when he died, there you died. And this is a truth that the church needs to get hold of. How I pray we understand this vital union that we have with our Lord Jesus Christ. It, it is more than a relationship, brethren. Paul writes in so many scriptures and he uses that verb in when he talks about our being chosen, he says we are chosen in Christ Jesus. When he talks about our predestination, he says we are predestined in Christ. When he speaks about our redemption, he talks about being redeemed in Christ. Even our forgiveness is in Christ Jesus. Our being made alive we are made alive in Christ Jesus. Our being enthroned we are enthroned in Christ Jesus. What is the point? The point is everything happens based on our union in Christ Jesus. And this has two faces. One, every believer is in Christ Jesus. And then Christ is in every believer. So what that means, whatever Jesus possesses becomes ours to possess. So you recall when he was still on earth, in John 14, 27, he says, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. So the peace that he has becomes our peace. No wonder the world is fascinated. And they ask, how do you go about about this. And why are they asking? 
Because they forget this truth that whatever our Lord possesses becomes our present possession. In John 15, 11, he talks about the joy and says, I have spoken this to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. So the same joy he has is the same joy we enjoy. No wonder true believers in Jesus Christ are a joyous people. Our life is hidden in him. According to Colossians chapter 3 verse 3. And according to Colossians chapter 3 verse 4. Christ becomes our life. So it is not just that our life is hidden in him. He himself becomes our life. So whatever spiritual life we have, inside of us, it is the Zoe the very life of Jesus Christ. It is Christ himself imparted to us by the Holy Spirit. Number three, we find again in verse three, it says you have been baptized into Jesus' death. And what that means is that when Jesus died, we were baptized into his death. We got that identity of being immersed into his death. So what that also means is that we died to our old life. And that is very critical. Now you may ask me, how does it happen? I, I don't know. That is the truth. Because some of these mysteries come to us by revelation. Because how do you explain about this incident in the Bible? Where an axe got lost in the water. And when the prophet came and asked whether it had gone down, this is what he did. He got a stick and threw it in the water. A stick will own no floats on water. But the stick sank. And the stick fished out the battle axe, the axe. So it became a case of a floating axe head and a sinking stick. So this doesn't make sense scientifically. Because we know wood floats. And iron sinks. But what happened in this case? Wood sank and iron floated. So some of what we know ceases to hold when God is in it. Here the scriptures say to us that we have been baptized into his death. What that means is that his death became our death. 
So we died to our old life. We died to the life we once had. We died to the life we lived before we became believers in Jesus Christ. In Romans 6, 5, he says we have been united with him in the likeness of his death. And our old man was crucified with him. Simply saying, he died for us. And we died to our sin. So, that is very critical for us to understand. In another portion of scripture, in Romans chapter 6 verse 16, this is how Paul puts it. Again he asks a question. He says, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone, as slaves of obedience. You are slaves of the one whom you obey. Either of sin resulting into death or of obedience resulting into righteousness. The point is that we once lived obeying sin. When we become born again, that relationship ceases. You now no longer have an obligation to obey sin. So you now are obedient to Christ Jesus. And that is why the death of Jesus Christ had to be real. It was not imaginary. He had to die. It was not figurative. It had to happen. Why? So that our death becomes a reality. So it can't be figurative. It has to be actual. So you and I that believe on Jesus Christ are then dead. Why are we dead? Because he died. So, that is important, which leads to the fourth reality that Paul brings here. He says in verse 4, therefore, we were buried. So, death had to happen in order for burial to happen. Let me say it again. Death had to happen in order for burial to happen. So what does that mean? We did not just die with him, but we were buried with him through baptism into death. So the fact that Jesus was placed in the tomb means several things. Number one, it means that he actually died. So he did not swoon, he did not faint. He did not fall into a coma. No, he died on a cross. He died that death of agony. So we who believe in him then experience a real death. Not a physical death. 
but a real spiritual death. And the consequence of that death means the Bible says, therefore, we were buried with him. So your old self did not just die on the cross. Your old self was buried with him. That old way of life was buried buried with him. Who you once were was buried with him. And somewhere in Colossians chapter 212, Paul places this emphasis and says we have been buried with him in baptism. Which brings us to the next point, which is the fifth reality. We were not just buried with him. The Bible says in verse 4 and verse 5, it says, therefore we were buried with him through baptism in death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we should walk to we should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly, certainly, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So we are not just united with him in death. It means that just as Christ rose from the dead and he is risen, in the same manner, we were raised. Now Paul uses something here. He says so that Christ, just as Christ was raised from the dead, and he says, by the glory of the Father, some versions say through the glory of the Father. So we too may walk in the newness of life. But I want us to focus on that word. By the glory of the Father or through the glory of the Father. What does he mean? He wants you to understand something. That the same omnipotence, the same glory that raised Jesus from the dead is the same glory that causes you to walk in the newness of life. That glorious power that broke the shackles of death, that broke the sting of death, that same power, he says we too, and we refers to all that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been raised from the dead. So a spiritual resurrection took place in our lives. Look at the sequence of things. See the baptism into his death, burial, now resurrection. So our old life was not panobitten. It was not repaired. Our old life died. Now the new life is 
the resurrected life that we now have. And talking about the walking in the newness of life, he wants us to understand that this is a life that can be experienced. Newness is the Greek word kainotes. Kainotes means a new state of existence. A different kind of life. A different state of existence. And this is what happens to you and I. It is not a resuscitation of the old man. When we talk about the death of the old man, we are not talking about your father. We are simply stating your old self that died. And this newness of life is a life to be lived. It is a life to be experienced. It is a life to be evidenced. It is a life that bears witness of every genuine born again believer that they have identified with Christ. They have been baptized into Jesus Christ into his death burial and they are now resurrected into a newness of life so this means that now you are living under a new master you are walking in a new direction. To use the words of Jesus, you are off the broad way and you are now walking on this narrow way in a new direction with a new life within you. And in verse 5 he adds, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death. And he says, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And this if is not doubting. This if is the same way you would say since or because because we have been baptized into Jesus Christ. We have been baptized into his death. And baptize is not water baptism. This is baptism of the spirit. So we have now been raised spiritually from the grave. To live a new life. In a new work. And this is a present reality. And I know many of us have the question, but why do I still struggle with the lures of temptation? Why do I have then to resist the advances of the devil? Why then am I enveloped into spiritual warfare? Why do I have then to discipline my body? Why do I have that ongoing battle between evil and good? This is one of the evidences that you are in Christ Jesus. You see, before you were saved, you were not fighting against sin. You are not, it's like fish. Uh, if I draw that analogy, living fish 
can swim against the current of water. But a dead fish will be swept towards the current with the water. So in the same way, we don't float downstream with the current of sin. We now resist sin. We resist its laws. We resist its temptation. We resist our former master. So that is the evidence that we have a new life which fights against the old desires of sin which leads us to number six. It says you have been crucified with Jesus Christ. In verse 6 he says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin may be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So Paul then just doesn't and it at death. He then brings to us the picture of what happened. He says we were crucified. So in order to be baptized into death, in order to be united in the likeness of his death, he says we were crucified. He says knowing this, he says this is something you need to know. The Greek word there is the word ginosko. And ginosko refers to experiential knowledge. So you have to experience this. This is not intellectual. This is something that you experience. It is a reality of every believer. What is this reality? That your old self was crucified. So everything attached to that old self, every curse attached to that old self, was crucified with Christ. Old self, that's the word self, is the word anthropos. It is where we refer to the word man, is where we get the word man, anthropos. So every believer in Christ Jesus the day he was crucified, you were crucified. So his crucifixion, being an established fact, implies that the crucifixion of your old man is an established fact. So th what that means is, then the power of sin can no longer govern you. So when Jesus died, when he was crucified, we were crucified. When it's like when he was laid on the cross, you were laid on that cross. So when he died at Calvary, you died. That old life, which Paul talks about as the body of sin, had to be done away with. How? By being crucified on the cross. Now, the body of sin is an interesting phrase. So it doesn't mean 
that this body we have is sinful. That's not what it means. That is a heresy. It is a Gnostic heresy that we should not take. Some people had hold it that our body is dominated by sin. That's not what it means. What it means is this, is that our fallen sin-centered nature, which is called the flesh, in certain circles, it is that flesh that old sinful flesh which Paul points out in Romans chapter 3 verse 10 to verse 18 when he talks about the throat the tongue, the lips the mouth, the feet, the eyes that do all the evil Everything that that represented was crucified on the cross. It was done away with. It was moved. So what that means is that then you no longer are under the direct influence of sin. So the rule of sin now is rendered powerless. Its power has been nullified over the life of every believer. And so which brings us to the seventh one. The seventh reality, which we find in the last bit of chapter 6, verse 6 and verse 7. Having said that, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And I want you to mark that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And verse 7, he gives the reason why. He says, for he who died, or he who has died, has been freed from sin. So what our union in Christ means, or this reality that we have to understand, is that you have been freed from the controlling tyranny of sin. So you were previously subject to the slavery of sin. Now you are no longer under the governing authority of sin in your life. You previously obeyed everything sin told you to do. You are powerless, you are weak to be able to resist it. So sin ordered you around. Sin was your taskmaster. But here is the good news. Now you have been freed from the slavery of sin. You were a slave to sin. Now you are a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you live to obey sin. Now you live to obey Jesus Christ. You see, everybody in life is a slave to something or to someone. So what that means, you have a choice who is going to be the master, that thing or that someone you are a slave to. 
we ye salida wo chichi chichi ogenda kufuka mudwa ulira chi oba muntu chi so as believers in jesus christ we have now been free from the bondage and the power of sin so that now we obey Jesus Christ. Why? Because he who has died is freed from sin. He who has died is freed from sin. Basically, what he is trying to tell us is that everyone who has been justified has been freed from sin. So, everyone that has been justified has been sanctified. So, the fact that you are justified your life changes dramatically. You have now been set free. You died to your old self. You no longer live for the same life, the same life you once had. You have died with Christ. You have been buried with him. You have been freed from sin's dominating power over your life. So if, so you ask me what, if you do not have this assurance, there are possibly three things. One, you have not received this revelation. You've not allowed this revelation to be personal to you. And that is very important. Secondly, your view of what Christ has done for us is perverted. And it needs to be corrected. And that is why we are here to help you understand what has happened to you now that you have believed. Or the third is this that you have never been saved. And today, I want to give you that opportunity to be saved. You are still in your sins. And you need a savior. It is only the savior Jesus Christ that can save you from your sins. When John saw him, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Today, you can embrace him and be identified with him. Be baptized in him unto his death. Be buried with him. And be crucified with him. And resurrect with him to a newness of life. Will you say this prayer with me? And he will come. The resurrection power of God, the same power that raised him from the dead, will begin to operate in your life. Why don't you say this prayer from the bottom of your heart and say, God, Father, creator of heaven and earth, here I stand before you, guilty. Here I stand before you, a sinner, in need of a savior for my life. I believe that Jesus is the savior of the world. He lived a sinless life. He died for my sins and he rose again from the dead. I believe him. I receive him as the Lord and the Savior of my life. Lord Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to walk in this newness of life. 
Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Amen. Amen. If you say that prayer, you have now been saved. You have been separated. The old is gone. You have been now separated unto God in union with Jesus Christ and separated to the divine purposes of God for your life. There is that number on the screen. Please, please call the number. Someone will receive and we give you those basic instructions in this wonderful journey where you will experience the power of the resurrection in your life. To the believer in Jesus Christ, this is the truth you need to lay hold of. This is the truth that you need to walk in. And in the next chapter, I will unveil to you how this is possible. So till we meet again from Dominion Church, it's been a pleasure having you. God richly bless you. Shalom.